Hi everyone, and welcome back to the lab. In this video, you'll notice I'm not starting at the whiteboard like I usually do, because this video really isn't about a chemical reaction, and so there's not really a lot of theory that I need to go into. In fact, this video is the first in a series of videos I'm making about some various interesting pieces of glassware I've picked up over the years while practicing chemistry, some of which I've not found a use for yet, or some just don't have many practical uses in the modern laboratory anymore. And this, is a, uh, this here is a prime example. In fact, this piece here is what's known as a drying pistol. And you can see it's vaguely pistol shaped, right? This would be the handle and you might shoot it like this, right? If you were to overlay it with a pistol, something like that, right? More of like an old timey one, I guess. Maybe that's why it's called that. Because uh, these were, were uh, really popular around the turn of the century uh, when glass techniques were not sophisticated enough to blow something as large as, say, a big vacuum desiccator. And that's exactly what this is. It's essentially a jacketed vacuum desiccator, which you can uh, heat using the jacket. Now, so for a really interesting design, you have this piece here, which is uh, essentially like a test tube inside a test tube, right? It's just one big open piece of glass, except it's got this jacket around it. And that jacket is fed uh, and drained by these two arms right here. And so what you can do is you set this on top of a boiling pot and say you can boil water or something and the steam will rise up through here and heat the contents of this without actually touching them, right? So it's just heating that inner tube. And then uh, you connect the condenser to this, uh, this joint right here. The condenser would return that liquid back into the boiling pot and you essentially just reflux through this thing and it would keep whatever's in here at a constant temperature. And that's important for reasons I'll get to in a minute. The second half here uh, is what contains the desiccant, and it's got this kind of bulbous shape to keep the uh, the reactant or the, the product that you're trying to dry, I guess, um, separate from the desiccant, right? You don't want the two to touch because you'll contaminate it. So you'd fill this bulb with desiccant down here, and then you'd use this arm here, complete with a, uh, with a stopcock, to draw a vacuum on the whole thing. And the vacuum will help pull uh, solvent or water or something else that's lower boiling out of whatever you happen to have loaded in the chamber. So together, it would look something like this. The compound I've chosen to dehydrate today is called citric acid, and I've chosen this for a few reasons. Um, citric acid, if you don't know, is a common food additive. It's used to make candies and things tart or more sour, and its name comes from citrus, which is, uh, it's the fruits, you know, citrus fruits are where it was first isolated, and it's largely responsible for the tartness or the sourness of lots of citrus fruits, like lemons, limes, oranges, grapefruits, all that. So citric acid is commercially sold as the monohydrate, as you see here, and there's a very good reason for that. It's because the monohydrate is a stable hydrate of citric acid, and it's stable across a wide range of humidities. If you were to, say, use anhydrous citric acid in a candy factory, you'd have all sorts of problems with the humidity in the air being absorbed by the citric acid, which would, number one, throw off any weight measurements you might be using to put into the candy, and number two, it would cause huge clogging problems with your machines. This would cake into a solid brick and it'd be really, really hard uh, to, to manufacture on any continuous basis, that's for sure. So citric acid can be dehydrated to the anhydrous state for, say, a chemical application where your reaction needs to have as little water as possible. And those reactions do exist, and it might do some, I don't know, but uh, definitely not in this video. So citric acid, uh, we're going to dehydrate this today using the drying pistol because it happens to be perfect for that. So what we'll do is we'll load desiccant into the drying pistol. In this case, we'll use some uh, anhydrous calcium chloride. We'll load the citric acid into the chamber here, and then we'll pick an appropriate uh, liquid to boil through this jacket right here to heat the citric acid to the right temperature. Now, according to my literature, citric acid can be dehydrated at as low as uh, 50 degrees Celsius. Somewhere between 40 and 50 is where it starts, or somewhere around 40 is where it starts losing its water, and around 50, uh, it's fully dehydrated. So we need to pick something that we can boil through here that has a boiling point of right around 50 degrees Celsius. The closest thing I happen to have in the lab is acetone, which has a convenient boiling point of 56 degrees Celsius, which I think is, uh, is perfect for this application. So what we'll do is we'll set this up. We'll get a boiling pot full of acetone. We'll start boiling it through here. We'll have citric acid added to the tube and uh, the, desiccant, the desiccant area. We'll pull a vacuum on this and uh, dry out some citric acid. Why not?
So I'm going to grease this joint up now. I've got a little bit of my vacuum grease here in this syringe, and uh, the grease I use is just this Dow Corning high vacuum grease, which is really good stuff. It's um, it's extremely resistant to pretty much all chemicals and stuff uh, because it's a perfluorinated grease, which means that it's really long chain hydrocarbons, which is standard for grease. However, instead of hydrogens, it's saturated with fluorine, which means that it's very, very chemically inert. It also makes it have an extremely high uh, boiling point and a very, very low vapor pressure, which means that uh, even in a very strong vacuum, this isn't going to evaporate, or at least not to any appreciable extent, which is good for uh, high vacuum systems. This stuff is kind of expensive, but as you can see, I've used almost none of this in, you know, eight years that I've had it, so it's good stuff. Uh, buy yourself a tube, invest in it. I figured I'd talk about it since this series is about glass anyway, but anyway, to, uh, to properly grease a joint, you really don't need much at all. I just... Uh, basically push on the syringe a little bit while dragging it across the surface and you can kind of tell where it starts to come out like that and maybe we'll do since this is a big joint this is 40 35 we'll do maybe like three of these going around there's almost no thickness of grease on this just enough and then we'll go ahead and take the female joint and we'll put it on and you can see where the grease is spreading out and if we just rotate this there we go and you can see that joint is almost completely perfectly greased and there's just this band here where it's not greased uh, which is what we want because that grease if grease gets past that band it's going to contaminate our product now not necessarily in this setup because there's no liquids flowing past this but uh, just just as general practice so you can see that's very well greased and uh, ready for vacuum now um, I've done the same thing with the stopcock same process um, you just undo this clip, the stopcock pulls off and uh, you can grease that up anyway I'm going to get the desiccant in here now and we can close this up the acetone in it and get started. Another point I'd like to mention is uh, getting powder into grease joints and past grease joints. So when these joints are greased and they're put together, you don't want to have any dust or any powder or any chemicals between the two because it'll break the seal. And uh, it's hard to do that because if you see now, I've got this vessel and I need to spoon desiccant into here, right? But it can't stick to the grease or I can't have it sticking to the grease. Now, on the other side, I couldn't have just put the desiccant in there first and then greased it because I need to rotate this around in order to get the grease evenly smeared. So how do you get powder into a vessel that has a pre-greased joint? And this is very important when you're dealing with, uh, with vacuum chemistry, especially like vacuum distillations or at least lowered pressure distillations, things like that. So what you need to do is invest in one of these. And this is just a funnel with a ground glass joint on it. It's a very simple apparatus. Now this is not the right size for this large joint. However, it will still help me uh, where I can put this in like that. And now any powder that I spoon into this funnel uh, will run right past the grease and uh, not contaminate it with dust or whatever. And here's the desiccant going in without a problem. The other neat thing too is that if they if the joints are the same size, you can use a Keck clip and clip them together so that you don't have to deal with things flopping around. There we go. Completely uh, powder free. And we will catch it. Give it a little twist. Perfect. And there's our drying pistol set up. We can also use the, the same funnel up at the top because I didn't put acetone into the setup before we started. I could put the funnel up there and uh, pour the acetone straight down through the condenser. Oops, I'm getting it everywhere. There we go. And you can see that that ran down past this tube here and it is now in there and we can uh, I'm actually going to give this a minute because I need to wait for the, uh, the little acetone spill I had here to evaporate before I turn on this uh, burner or use any electronics or something around here because it could uh, it's obviously a, a grave fire hazard at the moment uh, but yeah as soon as that evaporates then uh, we can go ahead and proceed all right you'll have to forgive the old fume hood sound but I've got it on to pull the acetone vapors uh, out of the room so we you saw we charged the setup uh, the acetone is now evaporated so I can go ahead and turn on the uh, the heat here, and uh, we'll start boiling that acetone and again refluxing it through this setup and heating our citric acid. Now I'll also put this under vacuum right now. One thing I'd like to note too is that uh, this joint I would normally, since this is a pretty fragile piece of apparatus, as you can see, um, 
I would normally have used a Keck clip on this joint, but the thing is, I don't have any other apparatus that's in 4035, and so I don't have any 4035 Keck clips, and I'm not about to spend, you know, 20 bucks or something trying to get a bunch here just for this. But once we put this under vacuum, um, you'll notice that it'll suck these two pieces together, and that won't really matter anyway. So let me just hook this up. This is my vacuum line. You'll have to excuse me because it's kind of loud. I'm using the water aspirator located right here in my sink. Uh, it runs through this line right here. This is the vacuum line. And anyway, you can see it's hooked up at this valve here, which I'll open. And uh, now this is connected to the system. I also have a vacuum gauge over there, which we can use to gauge the vacuum in the system when I shut it off. So I'll actually look at that. Okay, let's try this. Well, it helps if I open the stopcock in the apparatus. So you can see we're under vacuum. There's not really anything to look at now, but uh, the stopcock is not open. So when I open this, this uh, will suck the air out of this apparatus here, and you'll see this gauge jump a little bit and then uh, fall back down. So here we go, opening it slowly. There we go. fully open now, and you can see we're slowly, uh, it's a much bigger volume to pump down, but we are pumping that, uh, that apparatus down. Alright, and once this is down to about the maximum vacuum my aspirator can pull, which is, uh, which is right about now, I can go ahead and close the stopcock to just maintain the vacuum in that system, and turn off the vacuum pump, make sure there's no backflow, and uh, yeah, we can just leave it like this, and then periodically I can check the vacuum in here by turning the vacuum system up to maximum vacuum and just cracking the stopcock to, to see if we've, uh, uh, if we've lost any vacuum pressure in there, which we will as the water starts to come out. And as you can see, those are sucked together nice and tight. There's still a nice band here of grease-free joint, which is good. It means we're not going to get any contamination. Um, and you can see the contact surfaces there are really, uh, really transparent. Perfect. Just now getting the first acetone vapors into the uh, chamber there. Turn on the condenser water. You can see approximately the flow rate. Boiling more vigorously now. And you can see the water coming out of the citric acid. You can see on the double wall there's acetone between the two. Uh, there's the citric acid there, but on the inside top of the inner wall You can see the water vapor collecting right there and That's going to make its way to the desiccant eventually and leave us with some nice dehydrated citric acid right there. Well, I've been refluxing this for approximately 25 minutes and I uh, just checked the vacuum Unfortunately, I did it off camera, but uh, it is holding a vacuum so that's good, and it means that we're essentially uh, we're essentially at an equilibrium between the desiccant and the water vapor in there, and that there's not really much air in the way anymore. One thing I did want to show was that I have an IR thermometer. You can see it's uh, roughly what is it, 14.6 degrees C in here. Um, but this, you'll notice, is staying at a relatively constant 54-ish uh, degrees, which is perfect, since uh, we predicted 56 would be the temperature, considering that's the boiling point of acetone. Before temperature controlled hot plates and things like that were uh, were commonplace in the laboratory, or indeed before electric heating was common in labs, uh, where you had to rely on say a, a Bunsen burner or a gas burner to uh, to boil things. Uh, back in the day, these things would have been very common because this uh, is a great way of reliably keeping a constant temperature and not destroying something that is temperature sensitive. Um, and no matter how much I, I crank up this heating mantle, as long as I can condense it in the condenser, this will never go above. Uh, right around 56 degrees C. So you can see the utility in that. One other thing I wanted to mention was that the same rules for a vacuum desiccator apply to the desiccant in the drying pistol in that if this were say some substance that had HCl in it in addition to water I could put something like sodium hydroxide and calcium chloride in here to both absorb the HCl and the water. So the desiccant here is I just it's catered just towards water but it can really be uh, any number of things. Phosphorus pentoxide works great. Uh, lots of stuff like that. 
so I'm going to let this go for another, you know, maybe two, three hours, and uh, we'll see what the final product is like. Okay, it's been several hours, and uh, still refluxing at a decent rate. We haven't lost much acetone, which isn't surprising considering it's basically condensing right there. Really nowhere else. It's not even the first bubble of the uh, condenser there. Uh, our vacuum is still good. I just checked it at the aspirator. Uh, it's a little less because I'm on a well, and uh, my well pump doesn't kick on until, like, I think it's 35 PSI. It stops at 60, so depending on when you get it, you get a different vacuum. So you see here, okay, it just ran, so we got a decent vacuum. Let me open the line, and then we'll open the apparatus right now. There you go. You can see we're pumping the apparatus down a little bit. Uh, but I'm pretty sure I just let some pressure in last time I checked this because the, uh, the water pressure wasn't sufficient to uh, drive the aspirator as hard as it had been the previous time, which is good. So we're still maintaining a vacuum in there. Anyway, I'm going to turn off the heat now, and uh, we can analyze the, uh, uh, the citric acid that's in there. Let's see how that fared. Okay, so this has cooled down enough that the, uh, the acetone isn't going to evaporate at any significant rate when I pull this apart. Um, I'm first going to equalize this with atmospheric, and then remove this, and then we can go ahead and disassemble uh, this stuff here, and we'll dump the citric acid out and see if it's changed consistency. And again, normally we'd have weighed it before and after, but uh, in this case we're not actually using it for anything, so it's more just an example of how the glassware is used rather than an actual uh, application of it. Well, that's good. So there was vacuum in the line here, and uh, now let's see if there's a hiss when I open this stopcock. Yep, and we are now equalized, so I can rotate that off. I'll now uh, drain the condenser. Let's see here, I'll just first turn off the water to it, and then just pull this line off and let it drain into the sink. See the bottom of it. There we go. And this should come off. No problems. A little bit of acetone left in that. Okay, we're good. I'll dump it out onto this wash glass just to see. It seems a lot more powdery. Whoa! There we go. So it's, uh, the clumps are definitely uh, basically just disintegrating. They used to be pretty hard when I pulled it out of the, uh, the jar there. So it's definitely lost some water. It seems a lot more free flowing than it was. I don't know, but again, we didn't really do a, uh, a quantitative analysis here. It's more just qualitative, again, as a demonstration of the glassware. Well, that about wraps it up for the drying pistol video. If I could find an experiment that actually requires this specific piece of apparatus to do, I will try and do that experiment. But I cannot think of anything off the top of my head that I would actually use this drying pistol for other than this demonstration. I mean, it's really an antiquated piece of apparatus, more of a part of history than anything, and it's not particularly efficient at anything it does. I mean, for instance, if I was going to dry this citric acid normally, I would do what I did in a previous video uh, with refluxing toluene in a Dean Stark trap. It's much better, it's scalable, you can keep track of progress based on how much water was collected and stuff. So, even though this does have a piece of, uh, you know, a place in history, I guess, it doesn't really have much use in the modern lab. And I just picked it up, honestly, because the price was right and I thought it was neat. Anyway, if you liked making, or sorry, if you liked watching this video as much as I like making it, um, please press the like button. If you want to see more of these videos, please press the subscribe button. If you feel like donating to my channel, I do have a Patreon page. I'll put a link in the description. I don't collect Patreon money on every video I make, just the ones that tend to cost me a bunch of money. I try and make my lab break even, but I really don't need to make a profit. So if you feel like donating a dollar or so, thank you very much. That'd be great. Uh, if not, enjoy watching, and uh, I'll see you in the future. Thanks for watching.